Welcome back to This Week in Digital Photography. This week we're taking a look at some specific genres of photography, letting you in on the secrets related to gear and techniques or specific types of photography. For this video we'll be taking a look into macro or close-up photography. This is where we find ourselves getting into the finest of details, whether it's the texture on a flower petal, the hairs on the leg of a bee, or the sparkle of that wedding pin. Macro photography gets up close and personal with your subject, often giving you a chance to show off the subject in a way that viewers rarely, if ever, get to see. The world looks a whole lot different when you're getting in this close. So just what exactly is macro photography? Well, technically speaking, macro, or what is sometimes known as micro photography, is the study of subjects at a scale of one to one. This means that the subject records at exactly the same size on the sensor as it would in real life. In other words, imagine you were shooting this diamond ring on film, and when you got your negatives back, the diamond was the same size on the negative as it is in real life. One of the challenges with macro photography is that our cameras, just like our own eyes, need to be a certain distance away from the subject before they'll be able to capture and sharp focus. Perhaps you've seen your grandparents holding a book at the very end of their arms and squinting to read. Well, that's because if the book was any closer, they simply wouldn't be able to see all the words. All camera lenses have a minimum focusing distance, and anything closer than that will be out of focus. With all things being equal, the longer a lens is focal length, the longer the minimum focusing distance will be. Traditional lenses simply won't focus with a subject close enough to be able to record as a macro image. Let's take a look at an example. This photographer is currently out in the field photographing these tiny little white flowers. With a 35 millimeter lens, he'll be able to focus as close as one foot away. The 50 millimeter will require at least 1.5 feet, the 85 millimeter at 2.6 feet away, and the 135 millimeter will need to be at least four feet away from the subject. At those distances, the subject, in this case, these little white flowers, will be smaller on the sensor than they are in real world. So we as photographers need to have a way to focus a little closer than the minimum focusing distance. There are some options available and they range greatly in cost. Let's take a look from most affordable to most expensive. For starters, we can purchase a set of diopters for our camera. These are essentially magnifying glasses that are mounted inside of a metal ring that precisely matches the diameter of the front of your lens. They can be screwed into the lens to be able to focus a little closer. These lenses are easy to use and very affordable indeed. You can purchase diopters in a variety of strengths, such as a plus one, a plus two, a plus four, and you can purchase these individually or as a set. Expect to pay somewhere around $20 to $50 for each diopter. The drawback for diopters is that when they're in place, you will no longer be able to focus on subjects that are more than a few feet away from the lens. So you'll need to make a choice of whether you want to photograph close up or further away. But for a beginner macro photographer or someone who only shoots macro once in a while, these diopters are a great way to get in the game. Extension tubes are a hollow metal coupling that fits between the camera body and the lens and pushes the lens away from the sensor, allowing it to focus closer. There's no glass inside of an extension tube, and you can purchase them with the electrical contacts that allow you to remain fully automatic for both exposure and focus. You can also purchase these without electronics and then simply focus and expose all manually. Extension tubes come in a variety of sizes, typically measured in millimeters. So you can buy a 12 millimeter, a 20 millimeter, a 36 millimeter extension tube. These can be used in individually or they can be stacked together for even closer focusing. These are going to be a bit more expensive. Look at spending around $100 or more for a set of three if you buy them from Nikon or Canon or Sony. But you can buy them from third-party markets for a little less money. Like diopters, these extension tubes will prevent you from focusing at longer distances, but they can be far more effective than diopters as far as getting in close. One note of extension tubes, however, is that you do lose light with more extension. So your shutter speeds are going to be a little longer when you're using extension tubes. And for those who really want to get close, the bellows are a device that is exactly like the extension tube, but they are infinitely adjustable. Instead of getting 12, 24, or 36 millimeters of extension, 
You can set the bellows to any length you wish and focus very precisely with the dials at the bottom of the rails of the extension tube. Bellows are quite expensive, but they allow you to focus extremely close. It's not unusual using bellows to be focusing on an object that is less than an inch or two away from the front of the lens. Light is often challenged here because being so close, your subject actually ends up blocking the light reaching the lens. It can be very difficult to get enough light to make an exposure. Bellows also require the use of a tripod, which can slow down your process somewhat. But in order to get you really close, you're going to want to be on a tripod anyway and very carefully composing your images. A dedicated macro lens is the most expensive option for close up work, but they do have the big advantage of being able to switch seamlessly between close up and far away focus points. There are no additional accessories needed to add on or to get that close focus. The 100 millimeter macro lens here is a great portrait lens as well as a great close-up lens. This lens can focus at just 11 inches. If you remember earlier, we looked at a 135 lens that needed to be at least four feet away. A tripod is usually a good accessory to carry with you in the field for nature and landscape photography, but a solid, steady, and heavy tripod is just about essential for macro photography. At the very close working distances that you'll be working with in macro, every little bit of motion, either from the camera or the subject, gets magnified greatly. Add to that the fact that the depth of field at such distances is very shallow, and you'll definitely benefit from having the camera locked down to a solid tripod when composing your images. Remember to get a greater depth of field, you'll need to use a smaller aperture using a larger F number which will also mean that you're shooting at even longer shutter speeds. When looking for a tripod, remember that not all tripods are equally suited for macro. Some of the features you'll want to look for if you're buying a, a tripod specifically for macro is the ability for each of the legs to operate independently. In other words, no brace between the leg and the center column. You'll want legs that can splay out nearly parallel to the ground so that you can get your camera really low. And you can also look for a center column that can come out and be mounted sideways as shown in the center image, or even inverted to hang the camera upside down underneath the tripod so that you can get really low to the ground if your subject is on the ground. As mentioned before, subject motion will nearly always blur the final image if it's not super secure and if there's any wind at all. A plamp is simply a plant clamp. One end clips onto your tripod leg, the other end can be used to grip onto a flower stem to hold the flowers still during the exposure. This image shows a second plant being used to hold a reflector, which is bouncing some sunlight back into the flower. Additionally, some photographers will also mount a diffuser or a transparent white fabric mounted in a ring that will soften shadows and give softer, smoother light to your subject. When shooting macro, the depth of field is often a concern. When you are shooting it less than a foot away from your subject, you can often find yourself with a range of fo focus of less than half an inch. If, for example, you're photographing a dragonfly, you may well find that the eye of the dragonfly is sharp, but the tail could be completely out of focus. To give yourself the best chance of getting the full subject in focus, you'll want to shoot in aperture priority mode and set yourself a high f-stop, which gives you a smaller low opening in the lens and a greater depth of field. Remember though, that this will also give you longer shutter speeds. Again, another reason why a tripod, a plamp, or possibly even a windbreak, and even supplemental light might come in handy. At these distances, autofocus sensors on your camera may sometimes struggle to determine exactly where you want your image to be in focus. It can be helpful to set your lens for manual focus and very carefully rotate the lens until the subject is focused right where you want it. And finally, at such short distances, sometimes it can be difficult to get enough light to reach the camera sensor. For these situations, you could consider using a flash unit that is dedicated for macro photography. Macro flashes are generally smaller with less power, so they aren't blowing out the image, and they're generally designed to give you soft, front, even lighting. As a final note on macro, the world of photography editing has really opened up some great opportunities. Earlier, I had mentioned that macro photography often leaves us with an extremely shallow depth of field. 
This is where a method known as focus stacking can come into play. Here we see this watch face and the depth of field is so shallow that we can't even see both edges of the watch face in focus at the same time. Using focus stacking, we can photograph the watch and create four separate images or however many we need with the camera set to focus at a range of different distances. Here in figure A, we see that the far left side of the watch is in focus, and then in B, the focus is a little bit closer to the camera, and then C and D are each a little bit closer yet. After shooting all of these images, we can import them into an editor like Photoshop and let the program automatically blend all four exposures, selecting the sharply focused areas of each image to create one final image that has sharp focus all the way across the watch face. In closing, macro photography can be extremely technically challenging, but it can also be really rewarding, allowing the photographer to capture a world that most people rarely, if ever, get to see. Photographing very ordinary subjects can suddenly become very interesting when, this, when shown greatly magnified. And while you could certainly spend a lot of money in the field of macro, it doesn't have to break the bank. I'd suggest starting out with a set of diopters. Even if you're shooting on your cell phone camera, a diopter held in front of the camera's lens will allow you to focus closer and create really interesting subjects.